You going off about fat acceptance cringe is more cringe than in the fat acceptance cringe. Well, then you're being entertained either way, so you're welcome. Hello everyone, it's been a while since I've done a hate comments video, which means I have a bunch of hate comments, and all the comments in this video aren't even hate comments. They're comments that I had a lot of thoughts and introspections about that I wanted to show y'all. So let's go. Here's a thought. Instead of constantly scrutinizing these people when a good portion of them don't even eat fast food, why not attack our society that constantly pushes the processed food and the consistent barrage of commercials that show us unhealthy food? <laughs> the nerve of some people. I've called out the predatory nature of the fast food and processed food industries more than every fat activist I've ever seen combined. I've talked about how the processed food companies tricked people into thinking that their products are somehow cheaper than eating healthy, which they aren't. I pointed out that the fast food and process companies are worth far more than the diet industry, which is something that the fat acceptance community will never acknowledge. And this comment was on a video where this woman said that overeating is fine and everyone should eat however much they want in whatever quantities they want. Who does that mentality benefit? The people growing fresh vegetables and fruit? No, it's the fast food and processed food companies that mostly cause people to overeat. And you're coming at me? I don't see you making any videos on thin mukbangers on YouTube who are literally out here showing how unhealthy their lifestyles are. Quite hypocritical, but I guess that wouldn't get you as many views, aka money, than this, huh? My favorite part of this comment is the fact that she said, thin mukbangers. Not the fat ones, like Nikocado or Foodie Beauty or anything like that. No, it's the thin ones I should be going after. First of all, if you're a thin mukbanger, there's a good chance that you have an eating schedule so you can do mukbangs and not gain a ton of weight, which might mean only eating one large meal a day or even every other day. And if you could do that schedule and stay thin, I wouldn't say that you're unhealthy. At least I can't say for sure that you're unhealthy. But if you're foodie beauty size, I don't care how many meals you're eating per day. I know you're eating too much and that you're unhealthy. And second, I don't care about mukbangers in general. I rarely care about how much anyone eats, as long as they aren't encouraging other people to adopt or maintain unhealthy habits as well. If Amberlynn Reed or Chantel want to eat themselves into an early grave, or a thin mukbanger wants to eat 4,000 calories in a sitting, that is none of my business. I really can't stand that this entire community is just a giant echo chamber of people circle jerking themselves and just hating on fat people. Absolutely none of you are bringing anything new or innovative to the conversation about obesity and body positivity. I've been hearing the same arguments for like 10 years. What new information would you like? We've known obesity is unhealthy for thousands of years at this point. And there's only so many different ways I can say that. But I will give body positivity one thing. In the last few years, they have gotten incredibly innovative with their arguments. Like... Exercise is unnatural, and overeating is a myth, and going to the gym is classist, and low-rise jeans are fat-phobic because they don't look good on fat people. A new, stupider argument for why people should remain fat and why the world is fat-phobic comes out every day. I'm waiting for the day when someone says that stairs are fat-phobic because they encourage people to get their heart rate up. Or that building new parks is diet culture because it encourages children to exercise more, which will inevitably lead to an ED. Or that everyone should become fat because the water levels are rising and the earth is going to flood, so everyone should have at least a six-inch layer of fat on them if they want to float off into the sunset and be able to survive. Which sounds all well and good, but when you think about it, it's almost inevitable that an orca mistakes your body for a seal and you get unceremoniously slapped into oblivion. But that's not the point. I'm getting off track. My point is that we are not far off from any of these claims being made. So the rate of innovation in the fat acceptance community is truly staggering. People who align with channels like this either have internalized fat phobia, hold resentment towards someone personally in their own life who's unhealthy, or just hate fat people. 
please sound off in the comments which of these belong to you. Or feel free to add a fourth option, an other. I like to encourage new ideas. The way you're assuming a black, lesbian, trans person mentioning their weight loss would be torn to shreds? You ever listen to your own venom? Yes. I do. And I'm not assuming. I've seen it. I've seen black trans women being told they haven't reckoned with their own anti-blackness and anti-fat bias because they chose to lose weight. And if acknowledging that is me being venomous, then I am not the person to take that up with. This feels like a shooting the messenger type situation. I should not be the target of your rage right now. I do think you make some good points. But when talking about actual nutritional value, it is more expensive to eat healthier. And eating less and losing weight does not mean that people are actually healthier. It means they have worse nutritional habits and are more susceptible to illnesses, muscle atrophy, bone density loss, etc, etc. Anyway, sorry to ramble, but as someone who was physically ill for a long time and had an ED for a very long time as well, it makes me sick when people say, eat less, or it's actually cheaper to eat healthy. Yes, I know there are more and more cheaper, healthy options, but it's still extremely limited compared to the amount of cheap junk available, especially like some comments I'm reading, and it's like, hey man, that may be your experience or whatever, but it's so dependent on people's physical health, mental health, finances, living situation, who they're living with, the state of their house, what appliances they have, etc., work, transportation, etc. And simplifying it is ignorant, and if people blindly take that simplistic, generally unhelpful advice, that can cause people to be worse off mentally, physically, financially, etc., and give them much more problems than they had when they started. There's so much said in this comment, and I don't even know where to start. They said when talking about actual nutritional value, it is more expensive to eat healthy. And the only way I can interpret that that makes sense is that it is often more expensive per calorie to eat healthy. Like you can buy a bag of apples for $4.00 or you can buy a family size bag of chips for $4. The chips are going to have maybe 1,200 calories for the entire bag, and the bag of apples will have maybe five or 600. So per calorie, you are spending more money, but the apples are obviously way more nutritionally dense than a bag of chips. So yeah, it's more per calorie, but I wouldn't use that to say that healthy food is more expensive because the point of buying more nutritionally dense food is that you eat less of it. An apple is going to fill you up more than a serving of chips, so you probably will eat less throughout the day having eaten the apple. And then they said eating healthier and eating less and losing weight does not mean those people are actually healthier. It means they have worse nutritional habits and are more susceptible to illnesses. I feel like the only way this statement makes sense is if the person who was losing weight wasn't overweight to begin with. But this comment was made on one of my finances of overeating videos, and everyone in those videos has lost at least 75 pounds or recovered from BED. And in those cases, losing weight actually does make them healthier and improves their nutritional habits. And even if the muscle atrophy and bone density loss thing are true, which I don't know if they are, you're also lowering your risk of cancer and stroke and heart disease and a bunch of other diseases by losing 75 or more extra pounds on your body. So I would say that's a trade-off in the direction of being healthier. And the rest of this comment just feels like a long ramble that I cannot make sense of. Like, of course, someone's mental health or finances or living situations can affect how they eat. I've gotten a bunch of stories from teenagers who live with their parents and everyone in the household is obese because they all eat unhealthy food and it's really hard for these teenagers to lose weight because someone else is controlling their food supply. That's a living situation that makes it a lot harder to become healthier. But that still doesn't change the fact that eating less and eating healthier is cheaper. And part of the reason in those financial videos I asked people about their finances around things that are not just related to food, but also healthcare and exercise and transportation and clothing and all these other aspects is because being morbidly obese affects your finances far more than just the food you're eating. This person mentions mental health, work, and transportation as reasons why someone may not be able to eat healthier or may not be able to afford to eat healthier. But all of those things can also be greatly affected by simply being morbidly obese. 
you may not be able to walk as much, so your transportation options, aka walking or biking, might be limited. You may not be able to work as much because your size limits your ability to walk or stand or do certain jobs. Having a lot of really expensive healthcare bills can definitely affect your mental health. So all of these things they mentioned go both ways. Your physical health and mental health and work and transportation situations might be bad or non-conducive to losing weight because of the amount of food you are eating. So when I say it's cheaper to eat healthy, I'm talking about all of these aspects, including transportation, work, healthcare, travel, all of those things, even time. I've heard so many times that time is money and some people don't have time to lose weight. Well, do you know how much time you waste by simply being morbidly obese? The extra time it takes to clean your home, to walk to your car, to grocery shop, to shower a lot of the time. If you want to convert all of that time into money, there is a huge monetary disadvantage to being very overweight. And all of that extra wasted time and energy can also take a toll on your mental health. So I will unequivocally say that if you are morbidly obese, losing weight and eating healthier will absolutely be cheaper in the long term. It just will. Also, hey, to any commenters, you can make a point without being like, fat people bad, I'm only being mean to them because I'm worried about them. Hey, stop concern trolling in my comment section. Who's doing this? I do not tolerate that here. There are many people who are plus size from genetics. How else do you explain people of color being full figured versus white people? That's like assuming all black people just tan their skin to make it dark. So people of color being fat is just as genetic as skin color? Then why weren't people of color always fat? How did the obesity rate for all races have a huge spike in the past 40 years? That was genetics? Girl, you need to seriously educate yourself before you make these videos. If you're going to be fat phobic, at least get your facts right. Hmm. Maybe you're right. I should do some research before continuing my videos. Let's look up, are people of color naturally fatter than white people? You're right, Google. I'm sorry. This next comment was made on my fat phobia and ableism and dating preferences video. I think this video makes good points, but it fails to recognize that you can be obese and healthy, so assuming they couldn't adapt to being in a relationship with an active person is ableist, since it is making assumptions about their physical capabilities based on their weight, along with the fact that people who are not straight-sized are treated differently because of it, and you also did not honestly analyze the societal factors behind obesity, since if analyzed in a certain way, obesity can be out of one's control. Society is unaware though because these people are marginalized so much for their weight that they are not able to explain it to the mainstream, as well as the fact that media tries to make obesity appear controllable in order to fuel the diet industry. Therefore, you cannot want to date someone because they are overweight because you are not compatible, but because you dislike obese people because you believe they should be able to control their weight. This is an aspect of prejudice. <sighs> Was there a single ounce of punctuation in this comment? This comment is so <laughs> ridiculous. But I feel like it exemplifies fat acceptance as a whole. First of all, there were no points made. It all was just random fat acceptance talking point transitioning into other talking point without ever really explaining any of them. I also think it's funny that they said, you also did not honestly analyze the societal factors behind obesity since if analyzed in a certain way, obesity can be out of one's control. Yeah, in the certain way that comes from cherry picking random studies to try to make the point that obesity is genetic. That's the certain way you're talking about, and it's pseudoscience. And she also said that making assumptions about someone's physical capabilities based on their weight is ableist. No, it's not. But this part of the comment also reminds me of a criticism I've seen recently of the show Love is Blind. If you don't know what Love is Blind is, it's a show where contestants try to find potential partners by talking through a wall to see if they're compatible enough to get engaged. 
and they never see physically the person that they're talking to until they get engaged. And the criticism I've seen is that while the contestants can't physically see each other, they give proxy information that reveals in some way how they look. Like they'll say, I do yoga every day, or I go to the gym five times a week, or I go hiking every weekend, things like that. And it's true that that information does in some way give away how this person looks. But that just goes to show that your lifestyle, which affects your compatibility with other people, also heavily affects how you look. If I tell you I know someone who eats the same food every day, they eat oatmeal for breakfast, a homemade egg salad sandwich for lunch, and a butternut squash soup for dinner with vegetables and hummus as their snacks, you would get a mental image of a person that is pretty slim. You wouldn't know exactly what size they are, but you would guess that they're on the smaller side because of the information I just gave you. So when people complain that the contestants on Love is Blind give away some information that might reveal how they look, I'm like, what are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to not mention any part of their lifestyle that could possibly reveal how they look? Like if someone is a plant-based chef, they're not supposed to mention that. If one of the contestants bikes to work every day instead of having a car, they're not supposed to tell a potential partner that because it might in some way reveal how they look. And all this goes to show is that your compatibility with someone else is dependent on your lifestyle and your lifestyle affects your abilities and how you look. They're all related. And back to this comment, this person is saying that it's ableist to assume someone's physical capabilities by their size. That's bullshit. If we can agree that it's a reasonable assumption that someone who wakes up every morning and does an hour-long swim and does a 20-mile hike every weekend is probably a pretty slim and muscular person, then we can agree that someone who is 400 pounds isn't waking up every morning to go swimming and isn't doing 20-mile hikes every weekend. And making those assumptions about strangers isn't ableism. They are highly educated guesses based on observation. Overall, this comment feels like the person who wrote it had some fat activist whispering in their ear every talking point they could possibly think of, and she had to type it out as fast as possible. She was like, ableism, straight-sized, diet industry, prejudiced, keep typing, no time for punctuation. So this next comment was made on my Walkable Cities video. And if you haven't seen that video, I put a TikTok from another creator at the end of that video who also responds to the same person that I made my video about. So this is the comment. I don't see the point in ruining your entire argument at the very end by praising a TikTok creator blatantly and probably purposefully misgendering Jordan. You don't have to agree with their takes on fat acceptance, and I'm not saying I agree with him either, but it's kind of gross for you to shower support for a transphobe, especially when you at least try to be respectful of Jordan's pronouns in your own speech. It kind of undermines all the work you seemingly put into remaining at least neutral. So I guess Jordan uses he, they pronouns, and the TikTok that I put in the video, that person was using she pronouns, but in the comments, the person said, oops, honest mistake, I didn't know. Okay, that doesn't seem very blatant and purposeful in their misgendering. So you get to call this person a transphobe for not going to someone else's profile to get their pronouns before making a video, but you won't take the time to go to this person's TikTok to see if maybe they made a mistake, or at least give them the benefit of the doubt that it was a mistake before you call them a transphobe. And I ruined my entire argument by praising a transphobe? Oh my god. I gave a platform to someone who accidentally misgendered another person? How can I even keep this channel going after such an egregious mistake? I'm so ashamed. This comment is ridiculous. Anyway, gotta go take that video down so I don't drown in shame. So this next comment was made on my Marissa Matthews video. It says, Manosphere? What kind of channels do you mean? Andrew Tate? Or Pearly Things? Or Sarah Dawn Moore? Or Roma Army? Or what? I find it sad you don't see how excessively you're guilty of the things you're accusing pretty much everyone else of doing that isn't part of your worldviews. It's a bit ridiculous, honestly. Except for that bias. Great videos. Just a tad very biased towards your own physical and psychological makeup 
very unpopular feminist impartial and sourced opinions you hold. It is honestly mind-boggling how you see videos like these you're talking about here every day and still don't see something doesn't add up. That to see women in the Western world in the 21st century calling herself suppressed and marginalized is outright secondhand embarrassment, or cringe as you'd call it. Most unproportionately advantaged group of people in the history of mankind demands more advantages and safety again, feels rightfully suppressed and attacked by men breathing. Okay. Okay. When I first saw the word suppressed up here, I thought it was a typo. And I was going to leave it, because we've all had a bad autocorrect here and there. But then he said suppressed again. This was intentional. He meant to say suppressed. Wow. Everything about this comment is amazing. To start out, I don't know who any of these people or channels are. Second, there's no explanation of what I'm apparently excessively guilty of. So we'll leave that to the imagination. I think they're saying that I'm stereotyping all men in my videos, which I certainly didn't do. I was describing a subset of men that I feel very confident in criticizing. And the line, except for the bias, great videos. <laughs> I just love that line. Yeah, of course I have bias. I'm human. But then he said you have very unpopular feminist, impartial, and sourced opinions. He says that like it's a bad thing, but impartial means just or fair. And sourced usually means you have reputable sources to back up your claims. So saying that I am sourced and impartial is good? We want source and impartial. And you know what's even more ironic? Another word for impartial is unbiased. But he just went on and on about how improperly biased I am. And aside from that, he uses the word tad and very right next to each other. A tad means a little, and very means a lot. So he used two opposite words to describe the same adjective. That's incredible. So innovative. And then he mentions my physical and psychological makeup, and there's a lot to discuss with that reference that we will not be discussing in this video. And then I think he quoted himself as a source within his own comment. That's amazing. Why aren't more people doing this? I'm gonna start doing this. Not to mention that this entire quote is a fever dream in and of itself. Most unproportionately advantaged group of people in the history of mankind demands more advantages and safety again, feels rightfully suppressed and attacked by men breathing. You can't tell me hearing that quote doesn't cause a slight glitch in your brain. And he also said, feels rightfully suppressed. And I'm assuming he means oppressed. So if these people are feeling rightfully oppressed, doesn't mean that they're justified in their anger? Or are you saying that it's rightful for other people to suppress them? I think I'm just thinking way too much about this comment, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Needless to say, one of my favorites. Who needs acid when you have comically disjointed comments to dissect to launch your mind into the ether? Anyway, that's all the comments I have. I really enjoyed this batch. I'll see you all in my next video.